Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Fine Woodworking Magazine's bi-weekly podcast. I'm your host and Fine Woodworking Editor Tom McKenna, and joining me today are Regulars Executive Art Director Mike Bekovich. Hey, guys. And Senior Editor Matt Kenny. Hello, everyone. Um, how is everyone today? Just peachy. <laughs> I can tell. (laughs) Um, Before we get started, let me remind all their listeners to spread the word about Shop Talk Live. Drop by our iTunes page and leave a comment and prop us up with a generous star rating if you you so desire. I think I'm tired of saying that every time. Um, You can also find us at iHeartRadio. And please check our website for our exciting tool giveaway for our fine woodworking 40th anniversary. Um, This year we're giving away 40 great tools. But you have to, to you have to enter to win each one. This week you can win a Bosch 12-inch compound miter saw, but you have to enter by Sunday. And to enter, go to findwoodworking.com slash 40 sweeps. That's the number 40. Again, it's findwoodworking.com slash 40 sweeps. Um, That's my miter saw. Is I mean, it? It's literally not my miter saw we're giving away, but I have the Bosch 12-inch. I like it. Well, yeah. I'm jealous. It's, the box is in my office, and I keep looking at it thinking, I wish I had a 12-inch <laughs> compound yeah. Whoever wins saw. it, it's going to show up slightly <laughs> used. <laughs> no, it won't. <laughs> hey, um, one thing I, I wanted to remind uh, readers, or if they haven't heard yet, um, this year, Colonia Williamsburg, they are doing a, another great uh conference, uh, their wood, Working Wood in the 18th Century Conference, you know, it's open, registration is open now. Uh, this year, they're focusing on the pursuit of happiness, furniture for leisure and entertainment. Mm-hmm. And the, the conference is happening uh, the week of January 17th to January 24th. And typically, there are two segments um, every year. And it's a, it's a good time. I've been to a few of them. I think yeah. you've gone, Mike? Yes. Yeah. You know, one of the things they're f- focusing on, one of the pieces of furniture that they're, they're going to feature this year is a gout stool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that hurts. Because <laughs> everyone in the 18th century that had a life of leisure and pursuit of happiness had gout. Huh. So it's going to be a gout stool. Excellent. Well, I didn't see that in the program, <laughs> but um, if, if folks are interested in, in, in checking it out, it is a good show. Um you know, it's a cold time of year to go there, but the hotel is great, the uh, venue is great, and the, the presenters are very entertaining, and it's a fun time. So. Yeah, it's always a good show. It's always worth uh, going at least once. Yeah. If you if you want to sign up, go to history.org and go to the bottom of the page and click on uh, a tab called Conferences, and you'll get to the registration page cool. and uh, in a jiffy. So let's move on and get to a reader question. This one is from Skyler. His address is unknown to us, but probably known to him. And he says, hey, guys, this summer I acquired a Makita wet wheel sharpener and several stone wheels from a garage sale. I know you prefer your flat stones for sharpening chisels, but would you recommend using the wet wheel at all? My stones gradually work from a coarse 600 grit up to 8,000 grit. Yeah. yeah, this is the uh, the sharpener. Basically, it's sort of like a Tormek wet wheel grinder, except the wheel is, is flat, on its right. side. So you're really right. sharpening on the, the side or the flat portion of the wheel. Yeah, so it is a flat. St- it's like a flat stone. Yeah. yeah. What's the What's the new one with the sandpaper, which is kind of that whole disc the sander the thing? Work sharp. Is work that the sharp? work sharp? Yeah, yeah okay. it's like the work sharp, but it has stones. Yeah. Um, that's cool. I mean, I'm I'm down for the fastest, most reliable less burny way to get your primary grind going. Mm-hmm. So on something like this, I'd probably use it like I would use my Tormac, which I, I would give it a try, see if I couldn't use it to get um, a really accurate primary grind, say 25 degree on my chisels and plate irons. I'm assuming mm-hmm. there's some sort of like a tool holder or something yes. to maintain yeah, the angle. There is. Um, I'm not sure I would like go up to the really fine grits and try to put hone a whole secondary bevel on there. Right. I mean, one of the things that occurred to me about this is that, uh, and I'm just, I have a disc sander, right? A 12 inch disc sander. And uh, when you're sanding something, you have to be very careful because the closer it is to the outside rim, Mm -hmm. the more aggressive it sands. The faster it's going. Yes. Ah. So I, I, I know that on this Makita. Uh, th- stone thing that uh, the blades get uh, come into the wheel like at 90 degrees so that in theory they shouldn't be any closer you know one part's no closer to the outer edge than another part oh okay but I would be worried a little worried about that you know different speeds of the uh, 
part. And then, and hmm. so hone, you know, removing material more on one part of the blade than another part of the so blade. So you might hmm. sort of develop a whole sort of pressuring technique to maintain yeah. an even grind on there or something. Yeah. I've never yeah. used one, so I don't have a perspective. Could you flip your blade upside down and do it on the bottom? What? <laughs> <laughs> what? I, 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 I did I did want to pause really quickly because I don't know if Matt noticed, but Mike said he has a Tormac. Oh yeah, I know he has a Tormac. <laughs> oh, I know that, yeah. No, I you know, in terms in terms of the, the grinder, I guess, you know, if you got a great deal on it. Practice with it if you like it. Yeah, keep on, keep it on. Yeah, you know. But yeah, I agree. I would not use it for my honing. Right. I would use it for maintaining a primary bevel. I didn't even know they made eight thousand grit stones for. I didn't these either. things. No. Yeah. Well, I assume it comes with, uh, you know, some sort of a flattening stone. I would think, or some sort of a diamond dresser. I, I, wonder, so. I wonder how you I, do that. You know, I don't know. Those. That was yeah. That'd be hard because you know you're not talking about the edge of the wheel. You're yeah. talking about the f- the face the of the surface. wheel, right? And if you are always doing like say a 25 degree primary bevel on all your chisels and plane blades, it's going to wear a track into the stone. Yeah, you got to be able to flatten it somehow. Somehow, yeah. The Tormac has a little diamond dresser thing, which is cool. It, it clamps to the bar with that the tool rest sits on. And it's got a little screw advancer, so you mm-hmm. can just sort of set the height and then advance it really slowly across the stone, and it gets it really true and really parallel to the to the guide bar itself. Yes. Yeah, yeah but this is a much bigger surface to get flat. I guess so. Yeah, I don't know how you would do that. Well, maybe uh, Skylar will let us know how he does it when yes. he's uh, up and running. Yes. All right, we'll move on to question number two. This one is from Dave Thompson. Dave is in the process of moving his shop in southern Alberta, Canada, and that means it's it's pretty cold. Um, He writes, my tools will move from a heated shop to a frozen truck for several days. I'll be applying rust protector to cast iron tables and building boxes with leftover pieces of plywood to bulletproof random heavy tools. Should I be concerned about subjecting rubber belts or other pieces of machine to serious sub-zero temps? It's got to be really dangerous in Alberta if he has to make his cases bulletproof. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's really wild and dangerous still in Alberta. <laughs> well, maybe the moose are loose up there going what? crazy. I don't know. Um, what did, so well, I, he wants to know, oh. Yeah, I think, you know, in terms of the, the rust proofing, it's a good idea. In 2012, um, I did a review of, of uh, rust proofing products, and that was an issue... 227. It was the August issue of that year, and and the product that we recommend. It's kind of a catchy name. It's CRC Industrial 3-36, and um, it proved really proved to work really well. The one thing that um, was that we discovered in that test was that waxes and the natural oil products didn't hold up as well to to the rigorous test that we put it through. So, you know, coat the steel for sure. I don't know about the belts. I don't think you need to do anything with that. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, just Taking your stuff from a heated shop into a cold space, that's not going to cause them to rust. No. I find that um, you get the rust in the temperature changes going, like if you have cold tools and then you're, you bring them into a, a warm shop. Yes. Yep. Or say your, your shop is unheated, so it gets really cold at night, and then it starts to warm up during the day. And if your tools are sort of below the dew point, I guess, in terms of temperature, and it's a little bit humid, as the air temperature warms up, you're going to have the moisture in your air condensating on your tools. Yes. That's the killer. Yeah. Right. So, and it happens fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It does. Yeah. When In the springtime, when it's not, my shop hasn't quite warmed back up yet. Yeah. I open up the doors or something because it's like 70 outside oh, or 60. That's, that's, it's like instantaneous rust. Yeah, everything's wet. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. Um, it's the flash rust. Yeah, but again, it sounds like his stuff's only going to be in this truck for a couple of days. It's yeah. not like he's leaving it there for three months or something. So, right. I, yeah, I wouldn't worry about the belts. I think he's going to be fine. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the space shuttle has to have rubber belts on it somewhere, and that goes up into like sub-zero temp- temperatures what? in outer space. <laughs> Mike, they don't fly the space shuttle anymore. They used to. <laughs> hey, so, Star Wars is coming out, so it's yeah, kind of relevant. Yeah. So, like the little <laughs> X-wing fighters have rubber belts on them. They're Actually, the, the Lego X-wing fighter does have rubber bands on the back, and that's how the X-wings open up and close. <laughs> that's fantastic. I do know this. My son has one, so, so. that's how I know that. <laughs> 
Okay. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, Space Invaders, let's move on to Tool Bombs. I think Mike has what looks to be the best one perhaps ever. It could be the all-time greatest <laughs> Tool Bomb. <laughs> <laughs> this tool, once upon a time, was a Tool Bomb. It is now actually <laughs> one of my favorite tools of all time of the week. What? No, we're doing tool bombs. Well, so I am, I am discussing the uh, tool bomb portion of this tool's lifespan. And span is a good word for it because what I've got is this little expanding accordion type of thing. And it looks like a lot of knife blades on the top and bottom. So mm -hmm. there's verticals. It looks like there's eight little vertical knife things held together with an accordion. So these blades sort of extend and contract. Um, at, at theoretically even intervals. And this little doohickey was designed to make it easy to lay out your dovetail spacing across a case. So I thought this was like pretty cool. So I said, okay, I'll give it a try. It's one of those things I, I took home. I had it in a drawer forever. I said, oh, I remember that thing. I'm going to pull it out. And I started to lay out some dovetails. And I noticed that the spacing wasn't exactly even... Uh, on one side or the other. There's enough slop in the mechanism where you don't get exactly sp even spacing. So I thought, well, that's stupid because if this thing is designed to space things really evenly and it doesn't do, do that job, forget it. So I actually threw this in the trash can in my <laughs> shop and it was sitting there. And it felt bad. I mean, it, just because it doesn't do its job. Oh, it's got cool little knurled brass knobs. That's the coolest thing about it. One thing, you know, for our, our non-viewing uh, audience, if you ever had a um, a child gate that you know, oh, yes. retracts, yeah, this is what it looks like. Stairs, it, yeah. It's a accordion kind of thing. With knives. With knives, yes. Child's gate it's, with knives. It's not child-proof. <laughs> it kind of looks so, like a pantograph, too. Yeah, yeah, so then I just, so I pulled it out of the trash. I put it back in my drawer, and I got it back out, and I said, Okay, it's a hand tool. Not every hand tool is automatic. You need to sort of have the, the right technique. And if you are careful and you sort of visually space the knives apart, it's pretty even. And I don't really care that my dovetail pins are like exactly spaced. It's like it gets me in the ballpark. It makes some tick marks with some pencils and I don't have to worry about it. So this little guy, my apologies for having thrown it in the trash can at, at a certain point. I'm glad I rescued it. And I pull it out on occasion whenever I have more than a couple of dovetails that are, you know, on, on drawers that are or cases that are wider than where I can just eyeball it, which is what I normally do. So you actually use that thing? I do. Oh my gosh. Yes. That <laughs> thing's ridiculous. It's Mike. awesome. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> See what, what would bother me about it, and I almost got hopeful there when you started to say the problem with it was, is that all it does is even spacing. I never, you know, because all of my, the way I do Except dovetails. Except that it's not that even. Yes. The, yeah. You know, I always do dovetails where they're, you know, different sizes. Right. Across the width of the board. You like to sort of tighten them up in the center. Yes. Yeah. Have smaller dovetails. And uh, so I would never use that because it doesn't do that. Hmm. But then you start to say it doesn't come apart even. I was like, oh, well, but not really. Not for what I would do it. Well, one thing you could do is space it evenly, but maybe skip a couple of the knives. Mm -hmm. and double up in the center. So there you go. Yeah, it's still a dumb tool, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and who makes that tool? No, I'm, just <laughs> I'm just wondering how, how often Mike dumps his trash out. Right. <laughs> it was in there for like four <laughs> years. <laughs> all right. How about you, Matt? What's your uh, bomb of all time? Of my <laughs> my uh, tool bomb of the week? Um, well, so I was at the uh, art supply store and I was buying pencils, cool. and I just took a little bit of a risk, and I bought a number three pencil. Ooch. Yeah, yeah. it was bad. Yeah. <laughs> I should have bought a number two pencil. Yeah, number two, <laughs> best tool of all time. Best tool Ever. of all time, right? Number no, three? Not good. Not good. <laughs> it's one worse, <laughs> as a matter of fact. <laughs> it's like going up to 11 in the bad column. Yes. I don't have a tool bomb of all time this week, I don't think. Um, you can use mics. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> it's so bad that it's a tool bomb even for me. <laughs> well, it's funny because uh, my um, my tool bomb is actually similar to Mike's take, um, where although it's not really a bomb per se, it's more of tech, a bad technique. But I was given this uh, low angle smoothing plane by Lee Nielsen. It was a gift from. Um, fine woodworking actually in 2000 when we turned 25 
And I wasn't, you know, at that stage in my career, I was more into carpentry projects and I wasn't doing a whole lot of handwork. And um, I was eager to try it. And I had a lot of trouble using it because I just was unfamiliar with the whole logic and, and just the basics of hand tool use. And so it wound up sitting on my shelf. It's a really nice decorated decoration. Um, and it's got, a, you know, the little fine woodworking engraving on it with my name. It's a really nice gift. And I stopped using it for a long time. And I've been learning a lot about hand tools recent, you know, over the years and, and really kind of diving in using hand tools a lot more recently. And I just saw this on my shelf and I decided to grab it. I'm, I'm in the process of making a cutting board and I need to deduce a lot of end grain shaving. And I, you know, realizing what this thing is actually for, sure, yeah. I took it out, resharpened it, and set it up. And I was thinking to myself, what was wrong with me that I couldn't <laughs> use this thing? And it's a brilliant tool, and I love it now. Wow. So. so all these years, <laughs> it was you that was the tool bomb. Yes, yes. I was a tool bomb. That's <laughs> what. And I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say because it's a wonderful tool. And I think it all goes back to the fact that, you know, all things woodworking, there's a learning curve. And... Um, a lot of people have trouble with tools at first, you know, and sometimes it is the tools, but sometimes it's just you've got to use it more yeah. and get, get into it. Yeah. I think we should uh, just clarify, because it was a little confusing when you said this, that actually Lee Nielsen did not give you this hand plane. Taunton, Taunton bought it for me. Yes. Bought it for yeah. you. And let's yes. clarify that even further. Taunton gave Tom a little monogram <laughs> hand plane <laughs> in celebration for the 25th anniversary. I myself did not receive a monogram hand plane with my name on it. But you got a hand plane. I got a used hand plane (laughs) left over from a tool review that the company had subsequently bought. Nice. Well, I was the, at that time, I was the copy editor. And, um, you know, I guess the editor liked me. I guess. Well, I got nothing for Taunton's uh, Fun (laughs) Winter Organs 25th anniversary. So, of course, I was only 10 at the time. Well, our (laughs) <laughs> well, fortunately, you're here for the 40th anniversary. The 40th anniversary, and we're giving out all these great prizes to our yes. readers. Yeah. And you know what I've, I've gotten so far? I got a car. What did you get? I got a pack of American cheese slices. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't even good. It was like three weeks past the sell-by date. Now, was it cheese slices or cheese product? <laughs> well, it was cheese product, but they were sliced. It was terrible. Had you open the pack with a number three pencil? <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's move on to uh, our questions. And this one, uh, this one comes from Josh Harris. And um, <clears throat> Josh writes, I'm installing a Murphy door in my house and will be building the bookcase myself. The rough opening is 32 by 80 inches tall. How can I make the bookcase stiff enough so that it doesn't snag, sag and drag on the floor? Um, especially once it gets some crap loaded on it, he writes. Um, The manufacturer suggests a piece of quarter-inch plywood nailed to the back of a three-quarter-inch hardwood frame. Is this sufficient? Would I be better off with a half-inch piece of plywood in a rabbit or a groove? Oh, one one other thing. I have to add this. He says he loves the podcast, and I think this is toward Matt. He says, keep up the snark. Hmm. And it would be towards me, right? Because I'm uh, woefully deficient in the snark, so I apologize. Oh, that's baloney. You just don't do it on the podcast. <laughs> People think you're some super nice guy. I am. <laughs> I'm a very nice gentleman. Uh, so a Murphy door. So picture like a bookcase that swings, like the cool like hidden door yeah. in your mansion mm-hmm. or your yeah. lake mansion. And uh, so you're putting a lot of weight on this thing, and he's worried about this whole thing sort of sagging a little bit, and... You know, the idea, well, maybe that quarter-inch plywood isn't thick enough. What if I, you know, thicken that up to half-inch plywood? Um, I don't think the thickness of the material is that big of a deal. I have, like, the carriage doors in my shop are just poplar frames insulated, and there's just skin with quarter-inch plywood inside and out. And it basically creates a really rigid um, torsion box. Mm -hmm. So the structure itself is really resistant to sagging. In this case, you basically have a, it's a torsion box that's only skinned on one side. So I think if it's like, if the back, let's say that stays square, if the front is sort of unsupported, I could see this thing maybe twisting a little bit. So I think um, for that quarter inch back, I would I'd probably screw and glue it to the case, but also to any cross shelves. The, the more I could sort of get this quarter inch plywood nailed down to a structure, it's going to keep that from deforming mm-hmm. and allowing the case to possibly twist just a little bit. On the front, I would make sure I had a, a fairly hefty face frame yeah. because that face frame, I think, is going to resist racking on the front end as well. Yeah, and good corner joinery. 
for the mm-hmm. for the case itself will help. I think so. Yeah, as long as it doesn't come apart, I yeah. think it, it's more sort of you know what sort of skin or face frame on the front and back. How well is that secured? How well is each one going to resist that sort of torquing out of square? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that makes a torsion box, or the thing that makes a torsion <clears throat> box so rigid, is all that glue surface. Because, you know, you put all, you can either use like honeycomb cardboard inside it, or, you know, you do uh, a, a, a lat, sort of like lattice work of, of half inch wood or something that yep. all these little squares, and it's all that glue surface. Yeah. And so uh, you, I wasn't listening to your answer, Mike. That's okay. <laughs> but I think you might have said uh, that you definitely every uh, glue and screw it down to every shelf, yeah, mm-hmm. and also to the frame, and that'll make it really rigid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be done. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's get to another segment. And, and hopefully this isn't a heavy-use door. I hope it's not the door between your kitchen and dining room. Or, or the something. bathroom door. Right. Or, your, or it would be a perfect bathroom door. door. You know, if you had the bookcase on the inside, you know, so you could oh, just, yeah. you know, Automatic get reading. some reading material. It would be awesome. Well, also, if you fill the bookcase with books about the British aristocracy, it'll be very stiff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think it's time for our all-time favorite <laughs> technique of the week. And, and maybe Matt has something for us in this segment. Uh, <laughs> and I can't help it that I don't buy dumb tools like you guys. <laughs> Mine was yeah. a gift. Yeah, it's, right. <laughs> it's actually not a dumb tool. But holy cow, Mike's was. Um, <laughs> uh, so my technique actually is uh, something I've just started to do with boxes. Surprise, surprise. And actually, it came about as a, as a suggestion from our very own John Tatro, uh, Deputy Art Director here on staff, and a fine gentleman and woodworker in his own right. Um, and so John and one day and I were uh, talking about, uh, I was, not only am I making, the, doing the 52 boxes and 52 weeks thing, you know, I also make boxes for sale. And uh, right now I have uh, four, about 40 boxes that I'm making. It's two different styles, 20 of each, uh, to send. Some I'm going to send to a gallery. Some will be on my website for sale. Tom, did you know I have a website? No, I didn't. Tell us about it. It's (laughs) mekwoodworks.com. And uh, we were talking about the interior surface of the bottom. So what you see inside the box when you open it up. And one of the things I do on this these two little boxes, you know, I paint the inside with milk paint, mm-hmm. but that's pretty time consuming. And another thing I do on the inside of boxes is get really thin foam, like quarter inch, half inch thick foam, <clears throat> and cover that with fabric, right? And then put that in the box. That's also fairly time consuming. One thing I never do on the interior of a box <laughs> is put flocking. I'm just <laughs> just gonna say that never do that. <laughs> So, so John said, why don't you just glue the fabric down to the top of your bottom, you know, to the interior face of your bottom, and then you just glue the bottom in. And that's actually what I've done here recently, and it's oh. really clean. It's, it looks very cool. Yeah, yeah. I really like the, the clean look, and it's actually very simple, and uh, it works great. And, you know, I kind of miss having the padding in there, uh, which is unfortunate, but... I really do like the the super clean look, and I mean, do you I, glue the fabric to the bottom before you glue the bottom in? Yes. So, what's nice is that so you glue the fabric to the bottom, and yeah. these mm-hmm. these bottoms are plywood, and they have it's a very thin piece of plywood, and then there's a shop sawn veneer on this side on the bottom, mm-hmm. the outside of the bottom, and then I just glue the fabric directly to the plywood. And then trim it down uh, to flush with the edges. So you're not having to size these little squares and yeah. try to get them down even into the bottom of a box once no. it's all done. That's no, awesome. yeah. And then, yeah, so then it fits up, and it just like the bottom would be, the rabbit that it's glued into covers the edges. That's very cool. And it won't so bubble up. It's not going to bubble up, yeah. So it's really clean, and it looks really nice. What and kind of, did you use spray adhesive or some other product? Yep, just spray adhesive. Um, yeah, that, that box actually looks like a perfect size for a mouse coffin. Yes. Well, only if it had been decapitated. You'd put the body <laughs> down here, and you'd put the little head right up here. It's awesome to be a little... Yes. It also it does look like a little... 
like the, the Brady Bunch, there was in the corner of their kitchen, there was a cupboard that was sort of like this one with a big drawer at the bottom, and that's where Alice kept the 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 sweeper, the uh, broom. I never noticed that. You didn't? No. Well, I don't know what you were looking at on the Brady Bunch, but I was oh, looking at the cabinetry. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, that's my uh, favorite technique of the week. Cool. Yeah. I do have a favorite technique of the week. It could be of all time, forever. So what I what I brought with me today, it's a little stick, which is milled to roughly a half an inch square, and it's maybe five inches long. And I use this for when I am laying out through mortise and tenons, because the big challenge if you're doing uh, through mortise and tenon, first of all, when you're doing your mortises, you've got to lay out the mortises in exactly the location on the inside face and the outside face. Because if those locations are off and you go start to chop, those, the, the little tunnel that you're digging there is never going to match up. And then when you go to cut your tenons, and then your tenons have to be cut in exactly the same location. But then once you try to start to fit that joint, if there's any jag or offset in the mortises going from end to end, um, you're going to end up with gaps by the time you make enough room to, to fit those. Um, so I used to have a really specific and involved technique for fitting the mortise and tenon joint so the gaps are on the inside, hidden by the shoulders and the inside of the case, but it's really perfect on the outside. So, you know, when I was teaching, I would really stress the fitting part. Like, you cut them as best as you can. They're going to be offset. And here's a way to fit them so you hide the gaps because there's always going to be gaps. So I've changed my technique. And my technique now involves zero fitting because I use a dumb little stick and no measuring. I take a marking gauge and I set it, say I have um, two through mortises on my case. I'll set my marking gauge to the inside wall of my mortise. Don't really care where it is, I mark it. I stick this little spacer block between the edge of the workpiece and the marking gauge to scribe the second wall. Cool. Flip the board over, one marking gauge, spacer block, second marking gauge those walls are now exactly aligned both on the inside face and the outside face. So to line up the top and bottom, again, I'll take my marking gauge, set it registering off, say, the bottom of the case if it's a low shelf, and mark the top edge of the mortise, put the spacer block in, now I have the bottom edge. Awesome. Now I have my shelf with the tenons. It's the exact same width as the case side. Use the same marking gauge setting, mark the inside face of the tenon, spacer block, outside face of the tenon. So basically with a couple marking gauge setups and a spacer block, you can lay out mortises and tenons exactly where they're supposed to be. And from there, you just cut to your line or chop to your mortise line, and you have a perfect through mortise and tenons. I think Mike just wrote an article. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought you did all your mortises with... Uh, I guess it depends on the location of the mortise in relation to the end of the board. Yes. At a hollow chisel mortiser, in which case you would not have that problem with the mortises. I've stopped doing that. You have. Yep. You drill them out and chop them I just all. drill and chop. I find that's easier, more accurate. The minute you go to a machine like a mortiser, you're relying on the setup of the machine between the fence and the bit. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, it can be or the bit itself. So um, I find this, because it accommodates both the mortise layout and the tenon layout, I find that the, once I get my layout lines in exactly the right place, everything else is a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Then it makes up for a little extra handwork. And so that's why you stopped making furniture out of white oak and make it exclusively out of basswood now. Because <laughs> you're <laughs> chopping all those mortises. <laughs> uh, no, I'm still working in white oak. <laughs> yeah. um, in fact, I'm doing a little wall case with through mortise and tenons for the magazine coming up. We're going to be shooting that article later this week. And I am putting this technique to you. So, yes, it, it, uh, you're correct. I mean, it already is an there. article. Yeah. Awesome. I should know that. Um, <clears throat> my uh, all-time favorite technique of the week is uh, um, it's sort of, it's sort of tool-related. I've, I've, I'm making this, I'm going to hold it up, this monstrous cutting board as a gift. Wow. And uh, um, by the way, Tom, most techniques are tool-related. Oh, you're right. Thank you for that <laughs> clarification. <laughs> Always kind of on Matt for some snark. <laughs> hey, um, and this is a, it's kind of a big cutting board. And, and the that's folks, for a big old slab of meat. Well, that's exactly it. The, the guy likes to uh, smoke meat and uh, he's a, a 
a foodie, a big time foodie, but they're also into, you know, medieval stuff, Game of Thrones. He actually also, one of his hobbies is making chain mail. Okay. So um, he's a welder by trade. But anyway, um, one of the things I, I learned on a recent photo shoot, Garrett Hack was building a table project for us, and the table had a, a wide sweeping bevel on the underside. And to get there, he didn't want to use a router table. He just grabbed a draw knife and started hacking away towards some marked lines. And I, I basically decided to do that same thing. This is a one-off thing. If I was doing maybe multiples, I would find a machine to sure. get me there faster. Right. But um, I borrowed the draw knife from the shop, sharpened it a bit as best I could, not having you know any knowledge of how to get that thing sharp. But um, and I just carved away at the uh, at the beveled edges, and it, I'm still not finished, but. You know, the combination of the draw knife and my, my, you know, low angle smoother, which I, did I tell you I got it as a gift? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, is making for some really cool work. It's, it's hard work. I mean, it, it took me, you know, it was like 20 minutes to a half hour for each beveled face. You didn't choose a soft wood to goof around with. <laughs> no. Well, you know, it's a cutting board. So, um, and going across grain, it was, it was interesting. And one other thing about it, you know, last week we talked about, um, using dog holes and bench dogs and things. And for this, because I was pulling on the draw knife, I actually used the dog holes in front of my vise as a wedge. So I put, you know, uh, I put the, the work piece down diagonally, put a bench dog at the back end on the outside, another one on the inside. Oh, so okay. when I pulled it, it kind of wedged it in place. Yeah, so cool. it, it really was a, a, a cool learning experience. I don't know if I ever so want to do it again. You were doing that with the thing flat on the bench? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. I think I would have stood it up in my twin screw mm -hmm. vise, but I think, yeah, it's interesting. Well, I needed it flat because I needed the angle. And on the on the outside of my bench, I could go either way, whereas I didn't think of, well, I don't have a twin screw vise, but I wouldn't have been able to hold this. It's a pretty massive piece. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been able to hold it, hold it on my bench conveniently. But that's yeah. the key when you're working with hand tools is the tool wants to force the stock in a certain direction or directions. Yeah. All you need to do is keep the stock from moving in that specific direction. Yeah. And you go to town. So, you know, the whole notion of, of not really securing work and clamping it to your to your workbench instead of, you know, you can just use a little stop or a couple dogs or something just to sort of keep it steady in the direction it wants to go and go to work. Yeah, it's normally yeah. one direction. I think with what Tom's doing there, it actually would be two directions. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. it, it would not only would want to be, you know, I guess, pulling it towards you, but it would also probably want to kind of twerk out right. a little bit oh, when yeah. you pulled it. So you'd have to, if you, you know, it's like an L shaped dealy bob. Right. That's what I did. Yeah. So it, it kind of got wedged in, in place. Yeah. And it was fun. I, I don't think I mentioned that the cutting board is actually kind of. Um, it's an old medieval axe head shape. So I was going to I was wondering if that was a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to mention that because cool. that's what ties into the whole Game of Thrones thing. Um, and I hope they're not listening or watching the podcast. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're not listening or watching the podcast. <laughs> All right. Um, let's get back to the questions. Um, this one is actually more of a comment, and it's from Brian Gilstrap. He wants to chime in about dog holes and wagon vices. And he says, hey, guys, <clears throat> let me share a recent example where you might think dogs and holdfasts wouldn't be relevant, but were a huge time savings. I'm building some cases for a wall of cabinets and bookcases. I had the carcasses sent assembled, but I needed to attach the backs. I was pondering how to do this while making sure the carcass stayed square. I clamped one side of the case down, face down, rather, using the wagon vise, and the other end I adjusted until it was square, and then I used two holdfasts with battens to fix it in place. This kept the carcass square while I attached the back and was quick and easy. And he says, don't underestimate the efficiency and versatility of a wagon vise and a row of dogs, especially when used in combination with holdfast. And I think Matt wanted to talk first on this one. <laughs> I know Mike, I mean, well, all right. So actually, <laughs> yes, I did have an immediate response when, this, when we read this one together the other day. Um, and I've been thinking about how I should state my position my position on this <laughs> um, without being too much of a jerk. Uh, so first of all, very cool solution uh, to a problem that you had and that's great in the dog the dog holes and uh, the wa wagon vice and all that business worked out great for you. If this were if I were in this position and I uh, 
did this and, you know, all this worked out for me, I think the way I would be reflecting upon the situation is not, not so much to say, hey, look at this cool way I use the wagon vice and the dog holes and all that, but rather I personally would be thinking, okay, well, why wasn't my cabinet square? And I'd be thinking, what could I do? What kind of, what did I do wrong so that my cabinet was out of square? And what should I do the next time so that my cabinet is square so that I don't have to rack it unnaturally with a bunch of, um, you know, mechanisms to get a back into it, to keep it square? Yeah, he did That's... use a lot of, me- he did use a lot of mechanisms. <laughs> so that, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, great, the, the, you're right, this is a case where the wagon vice and all this other stuff t- worked well for you. Yeah. But I would also like to point out that if your case was square... So maybe address the bigger problem. The bigger problem. Yeah. Not being square in the first yeah, place. And yeah. Mike brought up a really good point when we I first can, talked about it, you know, how to square up a, a basic case as you're clamping it up. Yes. I can relate to Brian a little bit more because <laughs> on occasion my I, cases are not square. I didn't so. say I couldn't relate to them. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, but I think it brings up a, a really good point in that um, the tools you use, the tools you own, they tend to affect the way you work. They're they're basically, you know, the problem solvers in your arsenal. Yes. And like, if, okay, based on my set of problem solving skills, tools, solutions, um, I'm going to utilize those to basically address the problems I, I run across in my woodworking. Mm-hmm. And because Brian has an awesome bench, it sounds like, with the hold fast and the bench dogs and a cool wagon vice, he's going to put them to use and more power to him. Um, I think where folks maybe get led astray a little bit, and I think we're responsible for it, whether it's in a video where we use a specific you know, thing to solve a problem, or in articles where authors have some really cool tools. Um, I think sometimes folks can get the un, sort of the mistaken notion that they then have to have those tools in order to build this project, or or it's the or only work way. at a certain level, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the answer is now. Chances are, you know, you can make do with what you have. And for instance, I don't have all these cool things. And I do often have a case which is slightly out of square when I'm putting my, by, my back on. So I don't have a wagon vise, but I have a really long pipe clamp. Mm-hmm. So chances are I'm going to measure my diagonals. If they're not e- equal, I'm going to throw my pipe clamp across the longer diagonal, keep measuring until it's square, and uh, pop my back in there and call yes. it good. Yeah. yeah. And you, uh, what you said about how our tools influence our techniques yeah. and which is absolutely true and other things i've noticed in the shop and other working with people uh who have a, a wide variety of backgrounds it's not just the tools that influence your solutions but also it can be the sort of tangential training that you have mm-hmm. in related fields sure that you know will help you figure out how to solve a problem so you know someone who maybe has a background in ceramics is going to solve this problem one way but if you have a background in engineering you're going to try to solve sure. it a different way yeah and yeah. Uh, i think a common um, personality trait for <clears throat> our readers and audience and anyone who's building stuff is just you have an ability to figure out puzzles and problems and, yeah. and conquer them. And the people who are less skilled or who <laughs> give up on the hobby early are ones who are challenged by that. Yeah, and even really great woodworkers, they develop their own strategies. I mean, our old shop manager, John White, <clears throat> who's sort of a genius in the shop and came up with a lot of great mm-hmm. projects, um, he was a machinist by trade. So mm-hmm. he, he came up with a lot of solutions from his machining background in terms of to get things really accurate in really smart and efficient ways. I've learned tons of woodworking tricks from John because of his machining background. But yes. even some of our authors, someone like Michael Fortune, who designs really wild and crazy furniture, but then has the intellect to really sort of science the crap out of the solution and come up with a jig or or way to do some really incredible things. Um, and so he's a guy who takes a very much an engineering approach. Someone like Garrett Hack um, is incredibly intuitive and gifted, and he'll just sort of work his way to perfect. Mm-hmm. Well, I just, my, my machines, I just kind of get it close, and then I pick up my hand tools, and then I shave a little more here and here and here and here. 
And he's right to the same solution, completely different set of tools, completely different mindset on how to get there. Yeah, yeah, like, you know, if you, the, to going back to Tom's uh, cleaver, meat cleaver cutting board, <laughs> uh, Garrett had that solution, you just pick this up and you do this. Yeah. And then he said, well, if I was going to make a lot of them, I might figure out another way. If you were going to make a lot of those, the guy to go get the answer to would be Michael Fortune. Yes. Right. Because he would, even if Michael wasn't going to make a lot of them, he would still figure out the way to do it that would be the most efficient. He'd get you a jig. Right. In, in reproductive, you know, you'd be able to reproduce it accurately every time. Right. And he would take all the hassle out of it, you know. Yeah. And, and the funny thing with Garrett's technique that I, that I, that I copied or borrowed um, – he was so much faster than I was, and it's just because, you know, his draw knife was sharper, obviously, but his hand tool skills and sharpening skills are, you know, beyond reproach. And, you know, he hacked away that the, that tabletop and had all four edges done within 20 minutes yeah. and, you know, almost ready for a finish. It was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, let's move on to the next question. This one is from Dave Dietrich. And Dave is making a box of drawers. Uh, you know, he says that they're going to be two and a half inches, three and a half inches, and four inches tall. And it's going to hold, uh, they're all going to hold electronic components and small parts. And he wants to know, um, basically, no, Dave is putting, uh, these are going to be side hung drawers. And he wants to know where he should put the groove for the, the wooden slide that goes into the case, whether it matters, you know, in its location in the, the top to bottom of the drawer. Um, I think the two considerations are mechanics, what's going to make it most mechanically sound, and then aesthetics. Um, and then aesthetics, I would weigh in terms of what's the ultimate use. If I'm building some drawers in my shop just to hold tools and stuff, I kind of want it to look. I kind of want it to look nice, but I want it. I want to make it really, really fast with as little trouble as possible to hold the weight that the drawers are going to have to hold. Um, in which case. I'll nail some cleats to the uh, side of a plywood case. I'll make drawer boxes to ride on top of those cleats and add a false front to hide the little cleat part sticking down below. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, probably most down and dirty. Yeah, and it gives you more room inside the drawer, too. The yeah. drawer box can be bigger. Yep. So a step up is to do the cleats on the side and the grooves in the drawer. So then the, the question there, aesthetically, well, aesthetically, maybe you want to center this, the little slot on the drawer side in every single drawer. So in that case, if you have four different drawer heights, you're going to have four different settings for that. Kind of a pain in the butt. Um, you know, you could split the well, difference. Well, you could have one fence setting and then use spacers to get... That's true. ...to yep. center the groove on mm -hmm. each piece. Right. Or you can have the groove set equidistant, say, from the top edge of every drawer, and then your spacing is a little bit more regular, mm -hmm. easier to manage there, I think. Yeah. I don't think it, you know, in terms of its location, it probably doesn't matter a whole lot. In terms Not of on drawers this small. I think mechanically it doesn't matter. Yeah. Having it centered a little up, a little bit down, I don't think it's going to create a big enough issue in terms of the physics of where the drawer is supported mm -hmm. to um, impact that. So I think, to, you know, how nice do you want it to look? How much time do you want to spend on it? And... Uh, let us know what you come up with. I think what I would do, if I the way I picture this in my head is that when he closes all the drawers, all you see is the drawer fronts. Right. And sure. Right. So I think I would space them all the same distance up from the bottom edge. Okay. And that way, when it is time to put the cleat on the ca in the cabinet, mm -hmm. so what I could do is get a spacer. Let's say it's an inch up from the bottom of the cabinet. Uh, the drawer. Yeah. Get a one inch spacer, put it on the bottom of the cabinet, drill in my uh, cleat to the cabinet, put the drawer in, put that spacer on top of the drawer, and drill the cleat in, and just keep going up like that. And is assuming that you make the drawers the way I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. I tried that once, and everything got all wonky. And I find a better solution is to start with your spacer really long and do the top drawer first, mm -hmm. then cut that down and do the drawer below. Cut it down, cut it down, yeah. cut it down. That's oh, what I see. Bottom. That's yeah. similar. Mark Edmondson had had done a full on article on you know making these side hung drawers, and he had a, a similar technique that that Mike just mentioned. I, I don't recall what issue it was, but it was a few years back, and. Chris Gochner, when he built a tool cabinet for our, one of our tools and shops issue, did the, the side-hung drawer, um, and it, they looked nice, and he had some clever 
tips for doing it as yeah. well. I think the uh, reason that my technique didn't work for you, Mike, is that your cabinet was out of square. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, I would, I know for a fact it was a due to an accumulation of errors from you know. So, and that the accumulation of errors with that technique would the potential for that would be great. Yes. Yes. But however, I think if your, your accuracy were such, and it wasn't a built in for the bedroom, you're doing it in the middle of winter, wearing your sweatpants and socks, and just trying to get it done. You know that technique may have worked better. Yeah, Mike yeah. wears sweatpants to work every day, <laughs> so and un- sandals, and sandals with socks. It's so unprofessional. <laughs> it's usually <laughs> under my slacks, though. <laughs> all right. Well, um, I think that that's about all we have time for this week. Um, tune in again in two weeks on December fourth, and uh, you'll get our next episode. I can't believe we're heading into December already. It's kind of crazy. Um, yeah, fast upon us. In the meantime, let us know exactly what you think by leaving a comment on iTunes. And don't forget to give us the most valuable five-star rating. If you have any woodworking questions, send them as well as your comments to shoptalk at taunton.com. That's shoptalk at taunton.com. You can catch the podcast via iTunes, stream it on your computer at www.shoptalklive.com, or catch us on iHeartRadio. Thanks, guys, and thanks you, thank you all for listening. Have fun in the shop, and until next time, we'll see you. I bought a number three pencil. Ooh, yeah, yeah, it was bad. Yeah. <laughs> I should have bought a number two pencil. Yeah, number two. <laughs> Best tool of all time. Best tool Ever. of all time. Right? Number no. three? Not good. Not good. <laughs>